Good morning, St. James. I hope this finds you doing well on this, the second Sunday of Advent. And if you're watching this early enough, know that you are always invited to come and attend our outdoor service in our parking lot. Uh, I know that we recommend that you sign up on the, the, the Sign Up Genius, uh, but if you wake up inspired to come to church, uh, just come, but just make sure that you check in with an usher uh, so that we can uh, know who all is there uh, in attendance. But we'd much rather have you there than not there, and I know it'll be a little bit cold, but uh, bring blankets and warm clothes and, and come and, and gather for worship. Uh, we will have communion uh, this Sunday and, and hopefully be able to do that uh, for the remaining Sundays of Advent. So, Also, today is the day that we are collecting all of those gifts that you generously offered to, uh, uh, to purchase uh, for the angel tree. So please bring all of those gifts uh, to the uh, front uh, of the church. Uh, Jen Taylor will take it from there, and uh, we will be able to, to get them to the children who will delight in, in opening them. So thank you very, very much for participating in that. And as always, uh, it's a source of pride how, how generous uh, the folks here at St. James always are uh, when, when asked to rise to the occasion. Uh, also, uh, today is the day uh, that we would love to have your commitment for 2021 in hand. It allows us to begin uh, to envision what might be possible next year. I know uh, there's a lot of unknowns, but, uh, but when we know what we have to work with, we can, uh, we can be uh, as creative as possible and uh, envision things beyond our, our, our current circumstances. So please get your pledge card in, and, and we thank you in advance, and we thank all those uh, who have already turned in uh, your pledge card. Uh, also, we are planning Christmas Eve services uh, and all of our Christmas services, uh, and it will be unlike other Christmases, but I think it will be memorable, and I think it will be what we make it, and I'm excited uh, as we start talking about how to decorate the parking lot uh, and what the service might look like, and I do think it's going to be one that, um, that you will uh, go back to uh, year after year in your memories, so uh, it will be in the parking lot. Uh, this is Christmas Eve at 3.30 and 5.30. It'll be a short service, uh, knowing that it may be cold, uh, but it will be a joyful service. And how appropriate as we, as we celebrate uh, that child that was born in a, in a manger because there was no room um, that we celebrate outside in the elements. Um, I think it will be not just appropriate, but, but, but very meaningful. So please plan on being there uh, 3.30 or 5.30 uh, in the parking lot. You can, you're asked to bring uh, a chair, warm clothes, uh, and uh, uh, perhaps a candle. We're still working on the details of, of that. And then we will have a communion, a communion service on Christmas uh, Day. I think around, I think it said uh, 11 o'clock. Uh, also, um, one of the things that I'm... Uh, I'm always moved uh, when I participate in our Blue Christmas service. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very meaningful service for those uh, who struggle to find the joy in Christmas. Uh, it's often a, a time uh, where the memories um, uh, don't fill us with joy and, and, and remind us of our loss. Uh, and so we have a very meaningful service where we acknowledge that a Christmas, the Christmas truth uh, is that a light came into the darkness and the darkness could not overcome it. And no matter uh, where we find ourselves, uh, wh whatever grief we carry, uh, that light uh, is beyond that. And, um, and we gather and we find our hope in that light. This year, we are going to do that via Zoom. Uh, I know it won't be the same, but it is a chance for us to, uh, to come together and, and, to, and to share our grief and to stand in solidarity and to, uh, 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 to claim our collective hope. So um, that will be Wednesday the, the 16th uh, at 7 p.m. And all of this information and all the other things going on in the church uh, can be found uh, in the weekly email. Uh, and also be on the lookout for the quarterly newsletter that should have just gone out as well. So. Um, so that's a, a, a good snapshot of what's going on in the life of the church. And with that, we begin our worship. Last Sunday, we lit the first candle, the candle of hope. Today, we light the second candle, the candle of peace. We light it knowing full well that peace is elusive. And in some parts of the world, it is almost completely absent. Yet in this season of Advent, we trust that God is never absent from us. God is always preparing something new. And even where there is war and discord, whether between countries, 
within families, or within our own hearts. God is present, gently leading us to new possibilities. Loving God, in this time of preparation and planning, we thank you for the hope and the peace you unfailingly offer us. Show us the creative power of hope. Teach us the peace that comes from justice. Prepare our hearts to be transformed by you, that we may walk in the light of Christ. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. This is St. James. Hope you are staying safe and healthy. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Merciful God, who sent your messengers, the prophets, to preach repentance and prepare the way for our salvation, give us grace to heed their warnings and forsake our sins that we may greet with joy the coming of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for this gathering, and for all ministers and people. Pray for the church, especially for Michael, our presiding bishop, Susan, Jennifer, and Porter, our bishops, Ben and Ted, our clergy. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people, especially for Donald, our president, Joseph, our president-elect, the Congress and the Supreme Court of the United States. We pray also for those in law enforcement for their safety, their morale, and that they may know the support and gratitude of the communities they serve. We pray for those in the armed forces, their families and all deployed in harm's way, especially Mark. I ask your prayers for all those who have suffered or feared discrimination, mistreatment or violence because of their God-given identity. Help us to understand, to acknowledge our corporate responsibility, and guide us toward sustained healing, reconciliation, and unity. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, the lonely, the burdened, the anxious, and those in prison, especially during this season. Pray for those in any need or trouble, especially for Cassia, Tom, Pat, Patty, Nalia, Howard, Marilee, Karen, Helen, Carol, Bonnie, Steve, Judy, John, Joan, Ansel, Tina, Linda, Fred, Kay, Ed, Marie, and for those whom we name now, either silently or aloud. I ask your prayers for all health care and emergency workers, for those who continue to put themselves in an increased risk to provide essential services and those facing economic insecurity as a result of COVID-19. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of God. Pray that they may find and be found by God. 
I ask your prayers for St. James Episcopal Church and school, our Stevens ministers and their care partners. I ask your prayers for the departed. Pray for those who have died and any whom we now name, either silently or aloud. I ask your prayers for the peace and unity of the Church of God, for the faithful and growing relationship between First Baptist Church and St. James Episcopal Church. We give thanks for our blessings which we now name either silently or aloud. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. For wherever we find ourselves, we offer our prayers to you, the God who promises to abide with us. During this time, may we know and trust your presence in our lives. Continue to bind us together, embolden us as your church to be signs and agents of your hope, your healing, and your love. We pray this in the name of your Son, who came and dwelt among us, Jesus our Lord. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of Mark. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The word of the Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strong rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Two years ago, on a Sunday afternoon in Advent, I was parking the truck and making my way to St. James. And I must admit, I was feeling just a bit of anxiety. Jesse and the choir were so excited uh, and so invested in their performance of the Messiah. My wife Barbara was invested, and somehow there was a change in the Piedmont Symphony schedule, and suddenly St. James' performance of the Messiah and the Piedmont Symphony were in competition. As I was walking towards St. James, I was noticing that there was just beginning to be snowfall, very light. And I thought, oh, I hope this doesn't mean that people will lose their nerve and not show up. My anxiety began to lift as I walked into the church. Unlike now, it was comfortably full. It was warm. I sat down my anxiety began to lift. The church was filled, and then the overture began, the familiar overture of the Messiah. The strings began to sound, and then suddenly there was that gorgeous voice singing out, Comfort ye. Isaiah's words from the 5th century B.C. suddenly became the word for the moment. It was sung by a soloist. It pierced the afternoon. It pierced to my heart. Comfort, comfort my people. Two 
short years later, here we are. I'm, you're either going to hear this sermon virtually as you sit at home looking at your computer, or you're going to hear me preach this sermon as we're all gathered in the parking lot, as we are stalked by a plague, frightened for ourselves and frightened for our neighbors. In, we are experiencing this advent in circumstances we could not have imagined two years ago. We're facing our reality without the strings, playing Handel's Overture. We're not inside the warm church. Maybe we're feeling more like 5th century B.C. Israel than we ever have, feeling frightened and exiled. And yet, through the words of a, proclaimed by one of our lay readers, we still hear the same words. Comfort. Comfort ye. Isaiah's mouth was used by God for that first utterance of comfort ye. Then, about 500 years later, John the Baptist, in his ministry, echoes the same utterance. During the reign of Herod, at a uh, moment in time of great anxiety and profound stress, John, quoting Isaiah, says, Make straight. The highway, God's going to walk in to our midst. And then, in 18th century Britain, through the ability of a brilliant musician named Handel, suddenly the words are proclaimed again, musically. Comfort, comfort my people. Make God's path straight. He's ready to walk into our midst. My point is the utterance that Isaiah first mouthed travels through the centuries. The utterance is resounding through time and space. The utterance, God's word, refuses to be constrained or frozen in history but it is literally limitless in its impact. Why is this? Why is this that when I heard comfort ye two years ago sitting in a pew and I hear it now that I feel that God is alive and God's truth is piercing my heart? I think this is true because the God of Isaiah is the God of John the Baptist. The God of John the Baptist is the God of Handel. And the God of our lay readers and our preachers. And we are people whose ears have been trained by the tuning fork of God's desperate leaping words. A God who is so desperate that God's words leap and reorient us in our now, in our now capital N, in our desperate moment, in this desperate, different advent. God travels into our now on the straight, verbal highway built by truth-tellers. Make what is crooked straight. Turn from crazy making lies. Repent. Change direction. Or consequences will result. Not so much because God is angry, but because we are becoming obstacles on the highway. God in 5th century 
B.C. in Israel, God in first century Israel through John the Baptist, God in 18th century Israel, uh, in 18th century Britain, excuse me, through Handel, and God in the 20th century, 21st century America, wants us to straighten up. Not because God wants to indulge God's rage, but because God wants us standing in this cold parking lot or listening to my voice on your computer. God wants us to know His abundant, generous life. In fact, God is determined that we know God's generosity, God's abundance, even in our moment. And so, the Word leaps into our moments. It leapt into our moment with Isaiah, with John the Baptist, with Handel. And this week's, this week, as I was watching the news of all human activities... I heard God's word leaping into our history. I heard God's voice spoken through one of God's messengers trying to call us from uh, paranoia, which is a Greek word, to metanoia, the Greek word for repentance. I heard a voice in our present wilderness calling us to repentance. And the voice was the voice of a person with a very Advent-like name. The speaker that I heard in our now was named Gabriel. Gabriel, isn't that a wonderful Advent name for an Advent speaker? Gabriel spoke in our time. Gabriel spoke in our moment. Gabriel spoke in this Advent season. Gabriel Sterling was the speaker. And he's in charge of all things elections in the state of Georgia. Gabriel had to speak when he saw on social media a noose appearing on the neck of a 20-year-old election official who was just doing his job. With tears In his strained voice, Gabriel said, Repent! Like the Baptist, he was not intimidated by the rulers. He was not intimidated like Herod was intimidating John the Baptist or trying to, like John resisted Herod. So Gabriel resisted all constraining voices of his moment. Because truth needed to be heard in the valley and on the hills of Georgia. Repent. Truth is breaking in. Truth is breaking out. Truth is straightening out what has become crooked and confusing and chaotic. It's amazing. Even in our time, in our moment... There are powerful truth-tellers awaking us to make straight what has become crooked, confused, and constraining of life as God wants it to be lived. Julius Seymour is the pastor of, I love the name of the church, she is the pastor of Big Timber Lutheran Church in Montana. Wouldn't you love to be a member of something called Big Timber Church? I just love it. Reflecting on this season of Advent, she writes, the stories of Advent are the myths that shape how we are called to be in the world as followers of Christ. We are the truth teller. We are the God bearer. We are the righteous mensch. We are the angel accompanied every man. We are the forbearing elder. We are the faithful questioner. In our life, 
life's pageant, we will play all the roles and sometimes more than one at a time. We must also look to the other players around us. We are a community of supporting roles to one another so that the story plays out to the glory of God and not to our triumph or our detriment. So, it's a rich time. It's a moment. It's a now where God is urgent to break in and break out. So, speak God's truth now. Seek God's truth now. Speak God's comfort now, and be God's comfort now. Amen. Christ, the Son of Righteousness, shine upon you and scatter the darkness from before your path and make you ready to meet him when he comes in glory. 
and the blessing of God Almighty in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Our worship is now ended and our service in the world begins. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.